Check out the brand new shirts, including trusty blue and the Sting Money design, over at ProWrestlingTees.com slash 616 Entertainment. This video is also brought to you in part by the Patreon producers, without whom content like this would not be possible. The year is 1982. John Carpenter, Deborah Hill, and the team at Universal Pictures have turned the horror genre upside down with their 1978 smash hit, Halloween. The 1981 sequel, Halloween 2, continued the forward progress of the original, dominating the box office and spawning dozens of fictional copycat killers. Michael Myers, Dr. Loomis, and Laurie Strode had become key figures in anyone's slasher lexicon. And with two box office success stories under their belt, the studio was obviously going to exercise their right to produce a third film in the series. There was only one problem. Well, actually, that's a lie. There were a multitude of problems, so we'll take them one at a time. First off, two of the three main characters I just listed, including our villain, are dead, having been blown to pieces or burned alive at the end of the last film. Secondly, Carpenter and Hill didn't want anything to do with Halloween 2, and only participated at the risk of a lawsuit, so what the hell was the plan to get them involved with yet another sequel? The duo were absolutely done with Haddonfield's resident serial killer, and they'd made their stance abundantly clear. There was nothing in this world that could possibly change their minds. This, then, begs the question. How does Universal Pictures convince John Carpenter and Deborah Hill to participate in Halloween 3? Well, that's pretty simple, silly. You just... don't include Michael Myers. You know. The face of the franchise? The most famous of all slashers? Yeah, him. Cut him out. He's done. Hello Dan Dans, it's time to jump into the single most divisive entry to ever grace the Halloween franchise. You know, it's a ballsy idea to take the most marketable, most recognizable face your entire series has going for it and leave them behind completely, but that's exactly what Universal Pictures intended to do. Michael Myers, to them, was a thing of the past. That's a hell of a concept today in 2021, where we've known the character for over 40 years. He's starred in nearly a dozen movies at this point, but at the time, this was the direction they chose. Before I get too far into the weeds, let me get myself off camera by saying thank you for tuning in to the History of Halloween Part 2, The Failed Anthology. Now let's get to it. No matter how many times you say it, it feels like it doesn't make any sense, right? Just imagine pulling the lead character out of any other film series. Hey, are you guys gonna go see Superman 3? Yeah, Superman's not in this one though. The full title is actually Superman 3 Metropolis Uprising. It's about the citizens of the big city rushing the streets and reclaiming their lives from under the foot of the corporate fat cats. Not interested? Oh, okay, let's, uh, let's go see Rambo 3 instead. You know the one, right? Rambo 3, Pencils and Erasers? John Rambo's off taking care of business somewhere, doing whatever he's doing, and we're following his school teacher's sister who's trying to make a difference in the lives of as many young children as possible. Hey, where's everybody going? This is the stance many fans took back in 1982, and sadly, it's the stance many still carry to this day. Erwin Yablons, producer of Halloween and Halloween 2, has stated loudly and proudly that he thinks removing Michael Myers from the franchise was downright stupid and that he was not consulted on the decision at all. I take no responsibility for Halloween 3, Yablon said in a 2014 interview. We know that Michael Myers is the backbone of this whole franchise. Why they decided to leave that, I do not know. There is an answer to that question, but it's up to you to decide whether it was admirable or truly ill-advised. John Carpenter hated Halloween 2. He was done with it. The only way Halloween 3 was going to happen was if the series shifted in a brand new direction, and if there was ever a time to do it, it was now. We last saw Michael engulfed in flames, motionless, succumbing to a fire that easily could have left him as a pile of ashes. I get that he survived gunshots and nasty falls, but if the man has no skin and his muscles and tendons have burnt away, that's it. It's curtains. Dr. Loomis blew the hell up. Lori's probably in a sanitarium somewhere. It's over. It couldn't be more over, right? So why not move on? 
Why not take this recognizable name of Halloween and tell a new story? Hell, tell five new stories, ten new stories. Tell a new story literally every year. A guy with a knife isn't the only scary thing in the world, right? So why pigeonhole the franchise around one guy? Yeah, yeah, that's it. It'll work. It has to work. When you actually take a second to think about it, it's not a bad concept. A new scary story dropping every year, always around the titular October holiday, it's a hell of an idea. The series wasn't called Michael Myers, right? No, it was called Halloween. And as I stated in part one, Halloween can mean any number of things to any number of people. Michael Myers may have been the first story told here, but who's to say we can't find another iconic character across these spooky tales? I imagine some of these early creative meetings opening with, so if it's not about Michael, what the hell's it gonna be about? Much like the original film in the franchise, it was Deborah Hill who put the skeletal structure of Halloween 3 together with one simple sentence. Witchcraft in the computer age. That's it. That was the first seed planted in the soil. In the director's chair this time around was originally a man by the name of Joe Dante, who, by 1982, had already gained experience directing horror with such films as Piranha and The Howling. Dante was chosen specifically by John Carpenter, but he left the job behind, opening up the opportunity for somebody else. Dante's career would then totally flatline. He definitely didn't go on to direct Gremlins, The Burbs, Gremlins 2, Small Soldiers, and other successful projects. He just completely disappeared. Yep, let's go with that. Tommy Lee Wallace, the production designer and editor from the original Halloween, would eventually step in as director for Halloween 3. What's funny is that Wallace was actually offered the role of director on Halloween 2, once again a spot handpicked by John Carpenter, but he passed, having been, uh, a little less than impressed with the script for Halloween's first sequel. Much like Carpenter and Hill in this regard, Wallace was intrigued by Halloween 3 specifically because Michael Myers wasn't in it. This would be Tommy Lee Wallace's directorial debut, after all, and stepping into the shoes of another filmmaker's franchise, carrying on something that was their work, didn't get him excited. But a blank slate, a fresh canvas with which he could paint his own portrait, was much more enticing. It's funny that the question of how could you take Michael out of the movie is so often asked when the answer is actually super admirable from an artistic standpoint. It wasn't about the money for once. It was about creating something you could truly be proud of. Sure, we've got a cash cow on our hands, but what about our integrity as filmmakers? I'm sorry, but that's awesome. And I respect the hell out of it. Another janky piece of Halloween 3's background comes into the writing credits on this film. You see, Tommy Lee Wallace is listed as not only the director of this film, but the writer as well. And no one will tell you that's a bigger load of shit than Wallace himself. Here's the deal. A man by the name of Nigel Neal was contracted to write the script. Nigel Neal was famous for his science fiction work, most notably on the Quatermass series, which drew millions upon millions of viewers to their television sets in the mid-50s. Neal put together a script that both John Carpenter and Tommy Lee Wallace liked, but thought needed a little bit of work in order to get it ready for the screen. With this in mind, Carpenter penned a rewrite. Wallace then took Carpenter's script and rewrote that. By the time this thing was deemed ready for production, Neil was so pissed off that his original script had been changed and was so dismayed by what Carpenter and Wallace had done to it that he demanded his name be completely removed from the credits. Carpenter was never attached as a writer to begin with, so that wasn't an option. And now, Tommy Lee Wallace is listed as the sole writer. Does it feel like maybe things aren't running as smoothly as possible here, or is it just me? Either way, with the script finalized and a director in the chair, it was time to fill the shoes of our brand new characters. Much like the franchise's original entry, there are only three main roles I'm going to shed light on. Yes, we have a full cast with some good performances, but do you want to watch a fun retrospective or read a complete list of credits verbatim? Exactly. Our star, our leading man, is none other than Tom Atkins, who had previously worked with our dude John Carpenter on The Fog and Escape from New York. Atkins plays Dr. Don Chalice, a hero who, well, calling him a hero kind of lowers the bar a little bit. 
He's never there for his kids. He skips out on his job constantly. He's a medical doctor, mind you. He's not calling off his shift at the video store. People need him. And he's definitely got a drinking problem. But he's our star, damn it, and we love him. His tag team partner of sorts, played by Stacey Nelkin, is Miss Ellie Grimbridge. Our main heel, though, played by actor Dan O'Herlihy, is a man by the name of Connell Cochran. He's a business tycoon, a wildly successful one at that, and he's the master of the practical joke. Connell Cochran, the all-time genius of the practical joke. He invented sticky toilet paper. I know that's a lot of information all at once, but this is all super important stuff for a retrospective. And I know there might be comments coming through like, oh, you forgot about the novelization. You forgot about this. I assure you, I didn't forget anything. I can't uncover every stone. If I did that, we'd be here for three and a half hours, and that's just ridiculous. I gotta pick and choose my stories here, you know what I mean? And speaking of stories, look at that. I think this movie has a hell of a story to tell, so why don't we check it out? Dan Dan's This is Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. It's about a week out from Halloween. We open with a dude running for his life. He's hiding behind any little piece of cover he can find in a junkyard before he's snatched up by some goon in a suit. Not looking to die in the parking lot of a dirty old dump, our dude pulls some slick tricks and winds up crushing his attacker between two cars before making his escape. Who the hell are these suited sons of bitches? The running man seeks refuge in a nearby auto garage where Walter, this fine gentleman here, is chilling out. Feet kicked up, watching some shows and flipping through a magazine. The ad on the TV is from Silver Shamrock Novelties, and the products they're selling are the Halloween 3. Yes, this trio of masks are being marketed as the Halloween 3. There's your cheeky reasoning for why this is titled what it's titled. And no, I'm not kidding. This was director Tommy Lee Wallace's idea, and I actually think it's pretty clever. Anyway, scary crazy escapee man busts in like a bat out of hell, clutching one of the Halloween 3, spouting off some crazy shit like they're coming. Walter drives this maniac to the hospital, and it's a good thing he did, because those suited guys were already on their way. Switch over to Dr. Dan Chalice, our star who is visiting his ex-wife and their two kids. He brought them each shitty little dollar store Halloween masks, and they're like, fuck you dad, mom already bought us these silver shamrock masks. These are the new hotness. Don't you know anything? And there's that commercial again. This campaign is really sweeping the nation, isn't it? Hey, wait a minute. Dr. Chalice's ex-wife, isn't that Annie Brackett? From Halloween and Halloween 2? Yeah, it is. Her real name is Nancy Keys, and yes, that is her. Man, they're doubling down on the, hey, this isn't the old story thing right in the beginning, huh? Dr. Chalice is called away to the hospital, obviously, as the crazy man has just been rushed in. Walter's still here, explaining how important it is to help someone when they're in need. I told you Walter was the shit. And there's that goddamn commercial again! This time it wakes up our hospitalized madman and he starts talking about They were going to kill us. All of us. It's at this point that Walter gets the fuck out of the hospital. Not only is he the man, but he's smart. All seems well until one of those suited guys walks into the hospital and rips the mystery man's brain and skull in half. Holy shit. I have never seen that one before. What happens next? The suit man makes a quiet escape? Nope. He calmly exits the hospital, hops in his four-door sedan, and blows himself the fuck up. Dr. Chalice tried to chase him down to get some answers, but... Holy Jesus, what do you do in this scenario? You do what he did. Stare at it like, holy shit. The only thing anyone even knew about this mystery man was that the mask he was holding seemed very important to him. The next day, the man's daughter shows up to positively identify the body. Is she a babe? Yeah, she's a babe, so what? You might be asking yourself, why are you bringing attention to her looks? I'll tell you why. Because Dan Chalice is a doctor, damn it, and he has diagnosed Ellie Grimbridge with a bad, bad case of babitosis. I'm sorry, that was fucking horrible. The next day, Dr. Chalice is, where else? At the bar, sipping on gimmicks and smoking cigarettes. You get him, Doc. Hey, I've seen that movie before. And who might be sponsoring this showing of the 1978 horror classic? Well, Silver Shamrock, of course. Ellie Grimbridge shows up, telling Dr. Chalice that the nurses said she could find him here. Yeah, that's a good sign. 
and the two get to talking. They wind up heading to Ellie's dad's shop where Ellie checks her father's records. The last item he'd checked off on the list was to head to the Silver Shamrock factory to pick up more masks for his store. Ellie's got a hell of a plan to try and learn more about her father's tragic death. And it would be nice if Dr. Chalice could help, but he's a doctor. He has patients to care for. And he's got kids at home. He can't be running around. Just kidding! He cancels his time with his kids, lies to his ex-wife about having to attend a doctor's meeting, and grabs a six-pack of Steve Weisers before hitting the road with this hot, young, distressed woman who just waltzed into his life. What a guy. Jesus Christ, this commercial is everywhere. They're insisting that kids wear their masks in front of the TV during some big giveaway. Interesting. The town where the factory is located is creepy as hell. The type of place where everybody knows everybody else's business, and someone is always watching. Hmm, maybe more than just someone. In a place like this, two single, adult, out-of-towners are gonna stick out like a sore thumb. So Dr. Chalice poses our tag team as a married couple in order to help them blend in. And there we have it. Ellie's dad did indeed stay at this motel. Business is picking up. Goodness gracious is it picking up as the region's number one mask salesman, Buddy Kupfer, just rolled into town with his family in tow. This pleasant woman shows up too. Damn factory! Got their orders all screwed up, now have to stay in this dump again. What a hot spot. Time to do some detective work, right? We'll go directly to the factory. We'll Whoa, find out hold exactly on, slow down, slow down. It's getting late. I could use a drink. Or not. Jesus, Dr. Chalice, you need to go to rehab. Maybe I had to get another room. That would look sort of suspicious, wouldn't it? I could sleep in the car. Where do you want to sleep, Dr. Chalice? That's a dumb question, Miss Grimpich. Whoa, 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 they're banging already? I thought we were investigating her dad's shady death. Well, while our stars are bumping deals in this shitty motel room, the town locks down into curfew at 6 p.m. Even the cat has to come in. No! This place is beyond creepy. The ever watchful eye sees everything, including Dr. Chalice exiting a liquor store with a full bottle of dad soda. This fucking guy, man. He encounters a homeless man who drops one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. I saw that bottle. Thought it looked pretty heavy. Before he gets all weird about the town, the cameras, and the factory. He says they're evil and he's gonna burn the place to the ground. He says that Connell Cochran, Silver Shamrock's owner, is always listening. He's always watching. They part ways and less than a minute later, hey, it's the suit guys. Holy f- Fuck! They ripped his goddamn head off! I told you this town was trouble. Marge Gutman from earlier chats up Ellie for a minute, just being neighborly. But she happens to mention that one of the masks from her previous order was defective. The logo plate fell off. Hey, that thing looks odd, doesn't it? Marge fiddles with the trademark plate, which appears to have a computer chip in it. Why would a Halloween mask need a computer chip? There's no time to wonder about that because just then it blasts her in the mouth with a laser beam. Ellie and Dr. Chalice don't come to help because they are having sex again. What's that? Who cares? Poor Marge Gutman chokes to death on her own blood and pieces of her teeth as carnivorous insects begin to pour out of her gaping wound. This is messed up, for sure. But I also want to tell you really quickly that only after having sex with her multiple times does Dr. Chalice eventually ask Ellie how old she is. Goodness me, Dan Dans. Our stars only come out to check on the commotion when there's a whole team of guys wheeling Marge out of her room. The motel owner says that Connell Cochran will be overseeing her care. Did I mention that they're saying she's gonna be alright? What the hell is a businessman gonna do for an injured woman? And they're taking her not to the hospital, but the factory. When Cochran asks what happened, one of the guys responds, Misfire. This is officially bonkers. Dr. Chalice learns from Teddy back at the hospital that in all of her searches, she hasn't come across a damn thing pointing to who the man was who blew himself up after killing Ellie's dad. It's like there was no one in that car at all. After coming up empty-handed at the factory, Chalice and Ellie are about to leave when, what do you know, good old Buddy Kupfer is here, and he's about to get a full tour of the factory from Connell Cochran himself as a thank you for being his greatest salesman. 
Ever the charmer, Buddy invites Chalice and Ellie to participate. Connell Cochran is a weird, weird man. He's incredibly charismatic. He seems nice enough, but every little thing he says in this town literally gets him a standing ovation. I don't like it. It sends a shiver up my ass. Let me just say, this tour of the Mask Factory is so, so cool. This was like a dream of mine as a child. I thought masks of all kinds were super interesting, and to see how they were made? Come on, dude. Cochran refuses Little Buddy a mask off the assembly line because it hasn't gone through final processing, which even catches the attention of Buddy Sr. Uh, what final process? <laughs> Don't ask me. He questions Cochran several times, but ultimately gets nowhere. Have you noticed that the guys in suits are here at the factory, and that they're acting very strangely? Ellie spots her departed father's car hidden away in the factory garage, and the suited men spring to life, blocking her path before she can get close. This is where our tag team has seen enough and it's time to get the hell out of here. They've got to get a hold of the police from somewhere else. This whole town is compromised. But it's too late. Ellie is missing, and the men in the suits are hot on Dr. Chalice's trail. This is the exact situation Ellie's dad found himself in, running for his life, trying to avoid these henchmen. Chalice hides in the damn factory, which I guess isn't a bad idea. I mean, who would think to look for him there? Isn't that where he's trying to get away from? He tries to ask this old woman for help, and her head falls off! Wait a minute. What? Uh-oh! He got got. The fight is on now, and this suited some bitch is no selling punches like Sting taking Jeff Jarrett's guitar. It's looking bad for our main dude until he hits a beautiful sweep right into half guard and goes to work on suit man's body. What the hell is that? All right, hold on. The old lady's head fell off. Suit man is filled with wires. Are you telling me that every single one of Cochran's cronies are robots he built that carry out his bidding? And that's why this town is so goddamn strange? Good lord. Cochran waltzes in, barely bothered at all about any of this. He's more concerned with the broken head of the old lady robot, which he reveals was a rare piece built in 1785. Oh, and he knows who Ellie and Dr. Chalice really are. He never bought the couple from out of town cover for a second. Cochran even goes into detail on the creation of the robots as if he couldn't wait to brag about his work to someone who would react to it in a human manner. He mentions that the robotic inner workings were surprisingly much easier to create than the outer flesh, but in the end, creating a realistic looking human is just another form of mask making. Come on, dude, that is fucking awesome. Connell Cochran is a superb heel. And this is where the diabolical plan is finally revealed. The Silver Shamrock commercial that's inviting children to wear their masks while they tune in for the big giveaway, it's all a trap. The computer chips hidden in the logo plate contain microscopic shavings of Stonehenge, which, when in the presence of the specific audio frequency the giveaway commercial broadcasts, will trigger an ancient, evil energy across the entire world. If everything goes according to plan, millions of children will be viciously murdered as an offering to the ancient gods. The ancient gods who, in Cochrane's mind, are the true owners of Halloween. Children running around in silly costumes, begging for candy from strangers, having fun and laughing, this isn't what Halloween is about. It's an embarrassment, an abomination. And with this plan, Cochran intends to take it back. We see a live feed of the Kupfer family who believe they've been invited to take part in a focus group for a new ad campaign, but no. This is a trial run before the big event. Little Buddy dons his mask, sits in front of the television, and oh my god. The child's head begins to rot. Insects and venomous snakes pour from the cavities forming in his brain. This is absolutely grotesque and honestly, one of the coolest fucking things I've ever seen. Buddy and his wife are done in by the snake's venom and it's good night cup for family. Cochran intends to inflict this suffering on millions upon millions of innocent people around the world, making him, without a doubt, the greatest, most diabolical mastermind the Halloween franchise ever has or ever will see. 
Children from Seattle, San Francisco, Omaha, all over the place. They're wearing their masks and celebrating what may be their final round of trick-or-treating. As the sun sets, we see Dr. Chalice's own children wearing their silver shamrock masks, awaiting the big giveaway. Don't you dare try and tell me Halloween 3 isn't fucking awesome, man. I won't have it. It's worth mentioning right here that Teddy gets killed with a power drill to the brain just after putting the pieces together that there was indeed no living human inside that car. Eh, too bad she'll never have the chance to share her discovery. <laughs> Dr. Chalice is fucked. Cochran's got him all gimmicked up, tied to a chair, and he puts a mask over his head, hoping for him to suffer the same fate as the children. The giveaway is at 9, and the clock is ticking, so Dr. Chalice gets to work. He dropkicks the television, and uses a shard of glass to free himself from his restraints. We're given peeks at what time it is, building the suspense. In Halloween and Halloween 2, we had the chase, where Laurie was trying to get away from Michael Myers. In Halloween 3, we've got the opposite. Dr. Chalice finds his way to a telephone to warn his ex-wife about their kids' masks, and he rescues Ellie off the gurney she was strapped to, but after that, he's on a mission to get to Cochrane. And he does. He tampers with the controls, turns up the frequency, and dumps thousands of gimmick logo plates from the rafters, wiping out Cochrane's entire fleet of robotic henchmen. The frequency of the commercial triggers the massive piece of Stonehenge to come to life, activating a sacrificial circle around Cochrane, who catches eyes with Ellie and Dr. Chalice overhead. And this is the best part. Rio recognize Rio, and Cochrane knows he's been beaten. Call it a trick, call it a treat, the master of the practical joke has been one-upped, and he offers applause to our heroes before he's vaporized by the stone's energy. Honestly, I don't know what the fuck is actually happening here. This is like some HP Lovecraft shit where you can't even begin to explain what you're looking at. The factory burns to the ground and that's the end, right? Wrong! Ellie's a goddamn robot now! She was turned while she was incapacitated at the factory, and Dr. Chalice has to do away with her, sadly. With the clock nearing nine, he sprints through the night and winds up once again at Walter's auto garage. Chalice calls every television station he can think of, begging and pleading for them to pull the advertisement, and one by one, they do. Except for the last station. The frequency builds, the imagery flashes, and Dr. Chalice screams into the telephone for them to shut it all down for the sake of lives of millions as the screen cuts to black. And that's the story of Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Did that last network pull the ad? We don't know. Did hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of children and their families die that night? We don't know. Even in death, did Connell Cochran succeed in pulling off his vile, evil scheme? We don't know. And that is fucking awesome. You know who didn't think that ending was very awesome? Universal Pictures. They worried that the ambiguous nature of the climax might leave audiences distressed and actually push for a more concrete, happier finish to the film. John Carpenter heard their complaints and brought them to the attention of director Tommy Lee Wallace, who stood firm in that the ambiguity was the way to go. Ever the badass and respectful artist, Carpenter went back to Universal and said, nah, we're gonna leave it the way it is. It was very important to Wallace for this film to stand apart from the prior two entries in the series. Wallace has jokingly referred to the original and its sequel as Knife Movies, whereas Halloween 3 is rooted much more in the science fiction and occult realm borrowing greatly from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The warning being issued by the main character at the close, straight out of Invasion. A trusted co-star being compromised and turned to the other side in a big reveal spot, straight out of Invasion. The comparisons are numerous, but never approach copycat territory. It's interesting to note that Nigel Neal, the original writer of Halloween 3, didn't have any of these crazy situations present in his script. The story was in no way related to Stonehenge. We didn't see any child's heads rotting, Cochrane's goons weren't secretly robotic henchmen, so on and so forth. Kinda makes you wonder what the hell Neal's film might have looked like, right? I obviously haven't been playing the music from the film, because this is YouTube after all, and that's Copyright City. But I do have a funny story that I want to tell you guys about 
the happy, happy Halloween song, the silver shamrock jingle, as it were. You see, I used to manage a used electronics slash record store, and we would control all of the music that would play over the speakers. Now, the Halloween 3 soundtrack is on Spotify. Anybody can listen to it. You can listen to it. What I would do is I would cue up that Silver Shamrock song nine or ten times per shift. It would play, people would laugh, and they'd be like, oh, I, yeah, I know this song. A couple songs would go by, and it would come on again. And then you'd get the look of, really? A couple songs go by, it plays, it plays again in a row. That's four times now. And at this point, people are just like, will you fucking stop doing this? When that happens two to three more times, you go insane, and the entire cycle starts over, and it's all funny again. And I, I feel like you had to be there for it, but if you heard this song ten times inside of 45 minutes, let me tell you something, you'd be losing your mind too. Okay, let's get back to business. I just had to tell you that story. Did you know that the man's voice on the commercial is actually that of director Tommy Lee Wallace? Yes, kids, you too can own one of the big Halloween three. That's right, three horrific masks to choose from. Did you notice that Halloween three carries on the legacy of the opening credits featuring a pumpkin? This time, rather than a physically carved jack-o'-lantern, the image comes together digitally on a television screen, which is a fantastic ode, as well as a beautiful piece of foreshadowing as for how the story connects to technology. I was always a little curious about these kids' costumes. When I was little, everyone had a specific look they set out to achieve. Maybe you were Ghostface from Scream. My brother and I went as the Blues Brothers one year, even though everyone thought we were trying to be the Men in Black. Maybe you went out as... I don't know what the hell you did. But what are these costumes? Oh, I'm a skateboarding ballerina pumpkin head. Okay. Oh, I'm a witch with a pumpkin head. Actually, you know what? That one looks awesome. I can't hate on that. You know what? Fuck it. I'm not going to hate on any of them. Except for this one. I like how Dr. Loomis in Halloween 2 invented his own pronunciation of the name Sawen. Samhain. But here in Halloween 3, Cochran absolutely nails it. The Festival of Sawen. I can talk about interesting little tidbits surrounding the film all I want. I'm only delaying the inevitable. We need to talk about how Halloween 3 was received not only by critics, but fans as well. I won't dance around it. Halloween 3 was brutalized by most review outlets. They lambasted the decision to move on from Michael Myers. Many found the story to be overly zany. Some considered the ambiguous ending to be too dark to enjoy. The film's commentary around consumerism, evil corporate overlords, and the complete replacement of an honest worker were sometimes lauded, but otherwise cast aside as nonsense. This was 1982. These reviews were written in an era where everybody and their brother were incensed by the fact that we now had a Halloween movie without Michael Myers. Don't let anyone tell you this film bombed entirely though, because it didn't. On a budget of just over $2 million, Season of the Witch would gross nearly $15 million. Is that anywhere near the first two entries drawing power? No, definitely not. But Universal didn't lose their ass here, they just didn't pull what they wanted to pull. Tommy Lee Wallace himself has stated that the ultimate failure, which he admits he had a hand in, was on the marketing. He's made it clear that he doesn't believe audiences were ready for, or even made fully aware, of how massive a deviation this film would be from its predecessors, and that had the message been stated more clearly, things may have gone differently. Hell, Wallace has made a case that dropping Halloween 3 from the title altogether might have allowed the film to find its footing much faster than it actually did. And that's the thing. Halloween 3, in the end, found itself. Or should I say, the audience found Halloween 3, in the years and decades to come. What was once looked at as the bastard child of the franchise, the weak spot, the Achilles heel that's not even worth watching at all, is now celebrated. And I'm here to tell you, as someone who wore those not worth watching shoes for a long time, I was wrong. I discovered Halloween when I was a child, as I stated back in part one of this series. To me, Michael Myers was the story. He was the best part. He was what I was watching the movies for. So I can empathize with viewers back in 1982 who didn't want to go to the theater to see this movie. Because even 20 years after this movie came out, when I was 12 years old, I still hadn't seen this one. 
I was in my early 20s when I thought, you know what? I've been avoiding this movie for my entire life based on what it isn't. Shouldn't I at least give it a chance to find out what it is? And I am damn glad that I did. The critical reception and much lower box office numbers were all Universal Pictures needed to see, and the new anthology approach to Halloween was dead and buried on the spot. The proposed ideas about ghosts and other night fears were all cancelled. Michael Myers was definitely going to come back, they just needed to figure out how to pull it off. Halloween 3 Season of the Witch is still divisive in 2021, just about 30 years after its release. Director Tommy Lee Wallace has given extremely honest interviews over the decades regarding the film's reputation, admitting that, when it first came out, I was crushed, but he's since made peace with it. It helps that nowadays, fans flock to him whenever he appears at horror conventions or screenings, all with their Halloween 3 merchandise that they'd like him to sign, so that's good. Wallace always believed that Halloween 3 was a good movie, regardless of the drama surrounding a certain character, and damn it, I agree with him. If you're watching this right now and you haven't seen Season of the Witch, do yourself a favor. Did I already tell you about the whole thing? Yeah, I did. But you should really feel it for yourself. It's been this long and you haven't given it a chance, right? Come on. It's almost time. And don't forget to wear your mask. Thank you so much for watching The History of Halloween Part 2, The Failed Anthology. I hope you've learned a little something, or if you're an established super fan, I hope at least you had a good time watching. Next time out, we're doing it big with The History of Halloween Part 3, The Thorn Trilogy. You see, Halloween 4, 5, and 6 all follow the same story threads, and across these three films, the Michael Myers lore expands. Now, is that a good thing? We'll talk about that on August 27th, 2021. And listen, if you like this video, feel free to head over to patreon.com slash 616 entertainment to support the channel at any level you choose. You don't have to, but if you want to, that's fine with me. Until next time, I love ya, and I will see you soon. You see, Halloween 4, 5, and 6 all follow the same story threads. And across these... Fuck! <laughs> Why can't I say this line? It's not a hard line, Patch. Fucking idiot. And across these three films, we dive... Fuck! We don't dive fuck. What do we dive? What do we dive? There is no dive. The line is the Michael Myers lore expands. So what the fuck is this dive? <sighs> Shithead. We can save this. We can save this. We can salvage this.